Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, a cold steel I've been longing for for a long time has finally made its way into my collection. Off Grid has another exciting V2, and we take a look at serrated blades. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment from this past week was from the Lynn Thompson interview, uh, an interview that got the most views the quickest uh, than, than any other. Uh, this gentleman, this is Oxman1800, says, Lynn is the man. My dad and I are both huge fans and got to meet him at a restaurant at Blade Show one year. I walked up to shake his hand and he invited us to sit and chat. Then he gifts my dad and I two brand new uh, LT Vaquero Voyagers. Uh, I think he meant XL Voyagers there. Uh, when he said he loves his customers, he's being 100% genuine. My dad has since passed, and I will never sell that Voyager or forget that memory. So thank you, Mr. Thompson. And uh, this was a really nice um, well comment for a lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, it seems to strike a chord with people because Cold Steel has been around for a long time, and people have memories wrapped up in the brand i i myself have memories wrapped up in the brand you know like like one might with a buck or something a little bit older so uh and and i also think that people were excited to see lynn thompson um for lack of a better term let his hair down you know it was a it was a little bit more than an hour of conversation and um you know we usually see him in in little little bits and pieces and he's oftentimes a selling a knife or talking about uh, why a knife is awesome as opposed to talking about himself. So I think um, I really, uh, I really love the opportunity and I think people liked the show. So uh, thank you one and all Oxman 1800. Thanks for the comment and, uh, and the sentiment there. And uh, thank you one and all for watching and commenting. All right. All that being said, I think it's time to get to a pocket check. So I had this idea for a show that I'll do sometime in the future called Knives by Marines, because I, I have a lot of them, I, I came to realize. But uh, I think I'll wait till I can't remember when the Marines uh, Marine Corps birthday is. And I hope a bunch of you are yelling at your uh, speakers or at the screen telling me when I'll find out and I'll do a show around that time uh, about Knives by Marines. But this one, uh, this is the Les George VSEP and... Um, well, he's a Marine, and Les George did, uh, uh, what do you call it, EOD, so Explosive Ordnance Disposal, uh, you know, uh, hurt locker, uh, going up to bombs and, and uh, diffusing them, disposing of them. And uh, his, his love of knives, um, I mean, began before that, but he really started making knives for the job of digging up mines and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, this is his VSEP based on his rock eye. Uh, custom model. The VSEP was one of the first uh, sort of recognized um, uh, mid-tech knives out there. Mid-tech meaning uh, the the blade and the um, so the titanium blanks and the blade blanks and such were water jetted out elsewhere, and then he you know finished it, put it together, and sharpened it and everything. Which this day and age uh, we just call a custom knife, but at the time that was mid-tech. Uh, meaning, you know, some of it was taken care of out of house uh, by machines. And um, I have always loved this design. I, I uh, when it came out and people were calling it the Sabenza killer, I was like, yeah, I could see that. It, it looks so useful and so beautiful, utilitarian and sort of military. I, I just I think this design is just perfect. Uh, so uh, I got this one. This was a grail knife for me. I got it from someone in Singapore, and I thought it got lost in the mail. It took so long uh, to get here. But prior to that, I had gotten uh, the Rockeye Automatic by Protec. That was my entry into the VSEP model because uh, the VSEP was, was hard to get when I fell in love with it and way beyond my reach in terms of uh, cost. 
And uh, I was able to to get into the design, if you will, get behind the wheel of that design with the uh, with the first run of Protec uh, Rock Eyes, which if you like the VSEP, go for it. Uh, if you can't get the VSEP itself, get the Rock Eye. Uh, it's it's a great representation. All right, next up on me, I had in in a strange and random turn the Finch 1929. I say strange and random because you know I was trying to I was sort of doing that thing where you sort of labor over what slip joint you're going to carry, what fifth pocket knife you're going to carry. And uh, it, it occurred to me I, I could go for a Finch. They have such uh, a... <laughs> this one has all of the qualities I was looking for in a slip joint today, which is just sort of that traditional layout with the bolster and the bone and the shield and all that. And uh, I decided I didn't have to do a GEC or a case or a Jack Wolf. I could do this. And uh, because those were the features I needed or wanted in, in that today, something small, doesn't matter if it locks. I love these bolster locks. So Finch Knives has sort of two unofficial lines. I think they're unofficial. Uh, on, on one side, you have knives that are like this, bolster locks, uh, steel, or in some cases, titanium bolster locks with different covers here. Uh, in this case, this is a red uh, bone. They call this night crawler bone. Um, in other cases, they use wood or carbon fiber or G10, micarta, and it's with that bolster and the flipper. And then there are other, like a whole other half of their lineup. Uh, it whole, you know what I'm saying? The other half of their lineup is just a slab of G10 or a slab of micarta and a liner lock. So two great ways to get out of Finch and this awesome action. And uh, I have about half and half. Half of them are this style and half of them are the other style. Um, these are lighter or heavier, obviously, a little more metal, um, but they're all just so appealing. All right, so Finch 1929 on me. Uh, also with me today was my, where did I put it? <laughs> Hang on a sec. How embarrassing. Uh, oh, here it is. It's just so thin, it got lost in this pile of knives over here. Uh, my Kramer, uh, Eric Kramer, Custom Voodoo. Uh, there are two Kramers out there making custom knives. Robert Kramer, who makes exquisite kitchen knives, and Eric Kramer, who makes exquisite tactical knives. Fixed blade uh, and some, uh, he's getting back into the making folders. Uh, those, are, those are quite coveted because he didn't make many of them, but they're really cool. Uh, Dirk Warning has one. Kramer uh, Custom Voodoo here. I love that upswept blade shape, but uh, even with that sweep, the blade, uh, the point is still center line. Uh, the edge starts well below the knuckles, and uh, and so that point, you still get all of that sweep and and uh, the the uh, slashing capabilities there, but you still have the point right in the center, so you know where it is uh, at any blade orientation. I had him sharpen the top swedge. That's not a usual thing. Uh, whenever possible, <laughs> I have a custom maker, if I'm getting a custom knife, sharpen the top swedge. Uh, this one is so thin. It's This is a great EDC. Um, he makes other knives that are, well, they're pretty tactical, all of them, but you could get like a drop point Grinch from him, and it looks maybe a little less, um, a little less tactical than this, but, you know... Um, but they're very great for daily carry. That's what I'm saying, because they're so slender and so light. And the ergonomics of this handle make the thinness of the handle barely noticeable. It's a really, really comfortable handle. Uh, I did a, an interview with Eric Kramer, and uh, he's, an, he's an interesting dude. He, he works in the Coast Guard, protecting our coasts. So he started making custom knives for all of his buddies in the military, and they were all very large, gnarly sort of the kind of knives you might see in a Schwarzenegger movie. And uh, his friends were like, don't get me wrong. This is a super cool knife. But with all the other crap I'm carrying on my uh, LBE and such, I need something lighter. Plus, if I need to pull it out to actually uh, fight someone, it's, it's too big and cumbersome. And he started making them smaller and smaller and lighter and lighter. And uh, he zeroed in on some really amazing designs. So check out Eric Kramer. Uh, you can see him on Instagram. And then lastly, for um, emotional support today and fidget factor, worry stone factor, I had the Wingard wearables quill on me. 
wrapped in jute by me. It really, actually, that little extra bit of girth there really um, locks it in the hand when you have it in various uh, grips. I love this one. It's the hammer fist grip, so you get the benefit of that spike on your hammer fist. But also, if you're just going to punch straight, and I've hit uh, hard stuff with this now, and with this, it doesn't turn. Without it, it would crush me, kill my knuckles. But now I can hit something hard and and hit it with this, uh, the crest of this uh, curve here, and really uh, change someone's attitude if, if I make contact. So I love carrying it like this or holding it like this in my imaginary fights. Or you could hold it like this and have a punch dagger. You could hold it like this for uh, what, what uh, Zach calls a haymaker. I don't recommend punching like this. You're likely to hurt your shoulder or elbow. But, but you know, it, in this sort of uh, lighter motion, you could make that work for sure. This is just a great super finger. That's what he calls spikes. And I love that expression. It's a super finger because you can do everything you can do with your finger. Well, not everything, but you... Uh, the tough tasks you do with your fingers, scraping, uh, poking, reaching, scratching, um, you know, disemboweling. You can do that all with this little hooked piece of steel. So love it. Love it. It's a beautiful little sort of work of art in the pocket. So that's what I had on me today. The uh, the V-Set by Les George Knives, which, by the way, I didn't mention, has an absolutely buttery um washer action i love that i love that and and we don't see as much of that these days uh because of the bearings uh, i had eric kramer custom voodoo i had the 1929 by finch and of course the wingard wearables quill i want to talk about august and the gentleman junkie knife giveaway we've had a couple of really cool new v2s come in from off-grid knives and by v2 i mean he's uh, Kerry is always carry of off-grid knives is always updating his designs and listening to the crowd and and sort of uh, perfecting them. And he sent recently, I showed off the V2 Grizzly. Uh, this is the knife I'm always talking about uh, that I bring on vacation here. Here's the, the V1. This is the one I always bring on vacation. It's a great outdoor slash chef's knife, mostly, mostly a cooking knife. Uh, nice broad blade, high flat grind, very thin behind the edge. Uh, Aus 8 blade steel, um, substantial. Well, he redesigned it, thinned out the hand, handle, contoured it, took away the ridges. Uh, the handle is way more comfortable now. And uh, I suspect there's a bit of bit more um, lightning under, you know, uh, milling in the tang. It feels lighter. It's more balanced uh, right here up at the first finger, kind of like a fighting knife. Um, but then you also have that big broad blade. It is now 14C28 and definitely an improvement over OS 8A and or just the OS 8 from before. And then this one uh, with that high flat grind is just a little bit even slicier and thinner, like a little bit more of a chef's knife now than an outdoors knife. Uh, not that this is too much of an outdoors knife, but... Uh, uh, he does go out of the way to stress that you don't want to do heavy, um, like this is not a bushcraft knife. So even though it's like a camp cook knife, it's not a bushcraft knife. Extended that uh, jimping by about an inch on the spine. And uh, this is a really, really great fixed blade knife. And I know that um, uh, folder collectors out there outpace fixed blade collectors. But if you're a folder collector... I highly recommend that you get one, two, three fixed blades in your um, in your collection. One of them, of course, would be a big sort of combat blade. One of them would be a camp blade, like a, a survival blade, something like that, and uh, and then something and then something EDCable. So this could fall in in one of one of those categories. Um, so this is what you stand to to gain if you are a gentleman junkie. That is the high tier of support on Patreon. Every month we do uh, a tribute to them and give away a knife. And uh, that's what it is. This is what it is this uh, this month. So do check it out. Uh, you can do so by going to, to Patreon. That's uh, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You can check out the three levels of support there. Or you can scan the QR code about to pop up on screen. Boom. See that? And uh, that'll take you right there. Um, one thing that you do get uh, as a patron that I think is the most valuable is uh, the interview extras. Every time we do an interview, we do about uh, 10 to, to 
depends on who, 20 minutes or so uh, extra. And uh, I get to ask questions that uh, I've forgotten or that there just wasn't time for, or maybe that um, isn't for broader consumption. Uh, so hot takes, if you will. Uh, so a little bit of interview extras there when you become a Patreon member. All right. Uh, still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at some exciting new knives in Knife Life News and some exciting news in Knife Life News. And then we're going to get to the state of the collection and then serrated blades right here. On the if, knife Junkie. if you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife. And we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Gerber has a new release. Uh, Gerber, I was just thinking about them and and SOG and uh, some of the companies that have gone through radical rebranding over the past five years or so. Gerber's one of them. They have a new release. It's ultralight. It's called the Assert. Oh, that's a pretty good name for a knife, for an EDC knife. Uh, I got to say, as much as I, as, as much as uh, uh, Gerber tends to stick in my craw with their with their knives this one to me looks really really nice uh the assert is an ultralight knife at 1.87 ounces you can see it's got a waffle pattern uh lightening it on the outside and i i can only assume something lightening it out on the inside that's gfn that's the new deep carry pocket clip from gerber that i like very much uh though it's not inset um it it ramps very gradually around the screws and uh it's, it's a elegant solution um to to the screw issue uh this one has their pivot lock which is deceptive because there are actual pivot locks out there but this is their version of the axis lock they're just calling it the pivot lock though it's not on the pivot it's north of the pivot so eh, uh, with the naming there uh but uh it looks pretty nice um it, uh, it's S30V, which is still a super steel. It's just an aging super steel, kind of like yours truly. 2.9 inch blade and currently available. Uh, a cool thing there uh, is that you can remove the thumb stud or slide it up or up, up or down that slot and tighten it uh, for your thumb. Uh, not a, a, a necessary feature, but, you know, kind of cool. And I like the blue accents. So that is the Gerber Assert. I, I look forward to hearing from others uh, as to whether they like it. All right, next up from Civivi, three exciting new knives from Civivi. They just keep doing cool stuff. Uh, that is uh, par for their course. They have the new Elementum Warney. Elementum, the most iterated Civivi for sure, and one of the most iterated knives out there, uh, bar the, the Boker Burnley Quaken, which... Man, the, soon that will come in lightsaber form, no doubt. Uh, this Warney is beautiful. A very nice uh, uh, curve down and angle down to that tip. You could still use that for uh, thrusting, uh, or I shouldn't call it that, you know, penetration in a knife like this. Going, I'm thinking clamshell packages. Those are always hard to deal with. Uh, beautiful shape here, that nice straight edge. It is a Civivi. It will be very thinly ground, no doubt. Uh, it is in Nitro V and a liner lock, unlike some of their uh, recent, uh, you know, button locks, that is. Uh, okay, next up, down uh, below the bal Balder is what I'm calling it. A really interesting uh, Gladius-esque, dagger-esque Tonto here. Americanized Tonto with the faceted tip and a bunch of swedging and, and grinding up front, and a, and a line that goes straight down the middle that I'm not so sure, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, a design thing that, uh, it's it's where all the grind lines come together. It it's, it's, might be too many notes, but a, uh, a really uh, great looking four inch blade nonetheless, 14C28N, it's gonna have a G10, or micarta liner lock. I like the little hole in the flipper tab. I like the whole area around the pivot, the way that looks too. So good one. And you know, I'm always excited for the more uh, tactical, more four inch Civivis that have some big ones. 
that I like. All right, and then going down to the bottom, I'm not sure how you pronounce this. The This is basically a liner lock version of the Cetos, and this one kind of looks like it's <laughs> like it would be pronounced the same way because I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about my Latin. Catus maybe or Cetus, Cetus, A E C A E T U S. Um, if my dad's listening, he's he's telling me what it is just over the screen there. Uh, I love the bayonet ground blade. I'm a big fan of that style blade. Uh, it's sort of a fighter blade, a bayonet ground with a long um, uh, uh, pole there that you can use to to finger flick. I believe I've, if it's anything like the Cetos. And this one is three and a half inches, 14 C 28 and, and different from the Cetos in that it is a liner lock. The other uh, was a steel frame lock, 3.19 ounces, which I'm not sure what the Cetos was, uh, but no doubt this is going to be lighter. Uh, I'm betting they don't have a liner on the offside on this one. So uh, that is, these are all uh, in the offing mid August. So, I mean, basically uh, next week, these will be out and, uh, Excited to see those coming. Uh, next up, we all know about the uh, Blue Ridge Knives purchase of the Ontario Knife Company up in New York. Put 56 people out of out of work, uh, but hopefully, hopefully that is temporary. There is a uh, they did release a a little news release uh, saying something like this. I'll say this. I'll, I'll read this straight. Uh, from Blue Ridge Knives. Today, August 1st, 2023, Blue Ridge Knives Inc. completed their asset purchase of Ontario Knife Company from their parent company, Servotronics Inc. Servotronics Inc. reached out to Blue Ridge Knives uh, earlier this year to gauge interest in pur purchasing Oak, uh, Ontario Knife Company. The two companies entered into an agreement in July with um, Blue Ridge Knives agreeing to purchase all assets. Blue Ridge Knives Inc., is a wholesale distributor and will continue to operate as such. Blue Ridge Knives is working with OKC's previous management to sell them the manufacturing equipment so they may continue producing Ontario knives in Franklinville, New York. That's the end of the statement. So let's hope that that is what happens. Uh, they say that they are uh, working to sell manufacturing equipment to, uh, to continue producing. So let's hope that happens. Uh, I it, it seemed like uh, at least a good sign that if it had to be sold, it was being sold to a, a knife distributor and they would have some interest in continuing that legacy brand. Uh, and it's good news to hear that they want to continue it in New York, which means they would be using all the same you know machines with the same people, hopefully, presumably, and uh, retain that expertise instead of starting over somewhere else, So, especially uh, China. All right. Lastly, this this is uh, this is a nice one. This is a good story, heartwarming story, and that is that Knife Rights has uh, beaten Philadelphia, has won over Philadelphia, who had the most restrictive knife laws of any city in the nation, any city, even beat New York. Uh, this uh, was saying that you could not even. I mean, Philadelphia was saying you could not be anywhere in the city with a knife. Because uh, they considered any knife a weapon. So I'm just going to uh, read directly from this. Um, in 2014, Knife Rights published a list of the 10 worst anti-knife cities in America. At that time, 2014, New York City was number one. But we fixed New York City's gravity knife arrest problem in 2019, moving Philadelphia up to the number one worst anti-knife city spot. Now Knife Rights has accepted Philadelphia's offer to judgment in Knife Rights, Inc. v. Outlaw, our federal Second Amendment lawsuit that sought to declare unconstitutional and enjoin Philadelphia's laws that ban the possession and carry of any bladed arms, in paren, knives, in public. The city also agreed to pay $10,000 to cover Knife Rights legal expenses. How nice is that? Not only are they... Uh, not only are they caving and not only are they changing their absolutely ridiculous laws, but they're also paying knife rights for their, their time and their trouble and their legal fees. And uh, that just warms the cockles of my heart. I lived in Philadelphia for five years and it has a very, uh, the, you know, I, I, I think of it fondly, even though it was uh, <laughs> in the early 90s, it, it was somewhat rough, but I, I, I enjoyed living there. 
Uh, but there's always been uh, some some things about that city that make it hard to live there. And, and one of those uh, those knife rights were were one of them. Those knife laws and knife rights took care of it. Anyway, Philly, 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 Philly. Things have gotten better in Philly. All right, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at a new off-grid knife and uh, a cold steel that I've been yearning for for ages and finally got. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, so, a sent to me by Off Grid Knives is the new version of their Ridgeback. The Ridgeback, the, the original Ridgeback, is a Kephart blade, Kephart shaped blade uh, with a Scandi grind. I did a couple of videos with this knife, uh, chopping down saplings and doing stuff in the woods, <laughs> bumbling around. Uh, it is extremely sharp, 14C28N, uh, which is a blade steel that was basically the first blade steel. Uh, well, I shouldn't say first blade steel. Uh, it, it, a very common blade steel in Mora's and other Scandi ground Scandinavian knives. And so uh, apropos for this Ridgeback, well, uh, they have come out with a new one, a V2 in an... In, 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 <laughs> In an aim to improve, they have turned this into a fully flat ground blade, and uh, it is slicey as all get out. I got to say, um, when I first got these, well, two of them came, and uh, I've been noodling around with the black one, uh, with the blackout version of this. Uh, but when they when it arrived, I was a little, I got to say, I was like, oh, I kind of feel like this should still be a Scandi ground blade. Um, but I really like the full flat ground version. Now, I'm not a huge carver. I'm not a huge bush crafter. I don't know if if I were, if if I would really be missing the Scandi grind, but I got to say, holding them in my hand, I am finger heavy. It is so much heavier, the Scandi ground blade, than the um, than the full flat ground. And that's, you know, obviously because there's a lot less steel on it. Uh, but if it's just a camp knife that you're going to have on your hip, while you're camping and while you're going outdoors and doing all sorts of, you know, whatever you use your knives for outdoors, uh, carving, uh, see like for this one, it seems more, the full flat ground just seems more, um, universally useful. Not that you couldn't do food prep with a Scandi ground blade, but obviously this, this would be much better. And if you're doing the lighter tasks and such, uh, this might be the way to go. I'm wondering, I have not taken and pounded this through, uh, you haven't done any like kindling making or batonic i haven't done anything with these really um outside anyway so uh, i'm looking forward to seeing how they perform differently than this i mean this is a still a pretty thin blade but it's a much more obtuse angle behind that edge but that is that 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 bevel is the edge so i don't know i don't know uh scandy scandy versus full flat ground what do you think uh, I'm 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 saying that if I'm ca uh, carrying the Ridgeback out into the wilderness, I, I I feel like I would go for this this one, the uh, the full flat ground. Now the the one thing is they changed the steel on this to D2. Do you, now why do, why is it because it's less expensive or something like that? Do you think that was a business decision, or is it because it's a tool steel and more? Um, useful on a full flat ground uh blade for this for this kind of stuff i don't know uh, i know that uh carrie does great with the uh, off-grid knives does great with d2 and he's been very happy with how his uh, taiwanese manufacturers are doing it so maybe maybe that's it maybe uh except that the new grizzly v2 is in 14 c 28 n so I'm, I'm just curious about the steel choice um but uh so here it is this is the uh the ridgeback v2 and to my uh what am i gonna say dilettante eyes as an outdoorsman i'd say that this is a this is an improvement this as a as a kephart style blade to me this feels like an improvement 
if you're out there and you're you're yelling at your screen and you're disagreeing, uh, put it in the comment below politely and let me know uh, which you think which grind you think is better for this uh, Kephart shaped blade and for the for the outdoor purpose. I'm going with the full flat ground. All right, uh, off grid knives. Oh, by the way, let me show you. They also improved the sheath. Here's the old sheath, a pancake uh, with pretty with a pretty big footprint. And then here it is, the new taco style sheath, which I much prefer, uh, though it does have fewer lashing options. Um, this is not one uh, that I need many lashing options on. I don't think this will do just fine. All right. And then, OK, next up. One of the knives uh, that was brought back when GSM bought Cold Steel. Yes, the venerable Talwar XL. I love this knife. I can't believe it took me nearly 20 years to get one of these in hand. I think that's how long these things have been around. Uh, nearly. Notice I said nearly. Uh, that's a trick we use when we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, but this knife, I remember first, uh, well, of course, lusting after in all the videos and such. But I went to visit my brother. I was in Ohio and uh, I stayed in their guest bedroom. And this was sitting on the bedside stand. Um, like myself, he's got a knife in every room. And this was just out. And he had the OS 8 version. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Vic. I got S35 VN right here, brother. But anyway, he had the much inferior OS 8 version, but it still had the same ergonomics. I picked it up. I, I held it in hand and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is just another great, uh, versatile, large handle from Cold Steel. Like like the Voyagers and the um, Espadas and, and all the others, this has multiple handholds and they're all excellent. You can be right up here. And really, if you need to be, I guess you can come right up here. Um, there are a lot of sort of incidental finger choils on Cold Steels because they're very generous with the tang, so you can close them all one-handed. See what I mean there? Uh, so that can also function as a place where you can put your finger if you need to choke up for some, some reason. Uh, but anyway, nice wide guard area for thrusting. So you can be way up front here and not come up onto the blade, even if you hit something hard. Because you got finger groove, finger groove, finger groove, and somehow they all just fit. Uh, I would imagine if I had giant meat, meat, uh, meat hooks, they would still fit. Uh, but what I love is coming back here and then coming back here. It, oh, this feels great. Um, and it gives you so much reach. Look at that. Now, you'll notice I got this serrated, and we're going to be talking serrations today. But I got this one serrated be because um, of that upward sweep. I figure the serrations, uh, the upward sweep thing is uh, we, we know that it accelerates slashes, but we also know that a totally flat blade also accelerates slashes because of that tip uh so in an abundance of caution i got serrations just in case uh i'm slashing at something and uh and that up sweep of the blade starts to glance away at least i have five little blades and, and a big scoop and then five little blades and a big scoop uh to take care of business as the blade is disengaging you see what i mean five little blades and and a big scoop the serration pattern here is amazing. Uh, but yeah, so this this knife, the uh, Talwar XL, really, really is an excellent uh, XL knife. I, I, I'm really excited. I finally have it in the collection because it really was a missing link. And I had the four inch in OS 8 and I foolishly sold that, uh, but they are re-releasing that one too. So I look forward to, uh, to checking that checking that one out all right now that we've gotten through that i'm gonna back up and and uh, we're gonna talk about serrations and and by back up i mean we're not gonna talk about cold steel serrations till the end because to me they are just the bomb one might say the bomb diggity um and if in the future my daughters watch this they will cringe right there all right so let's talk about emerson first let's talk about different um different serration patterns. Now, Emerson blades, Emerson knives has, here, I'm going to show you on the two that I have, that the Emerson CQC 13 and the Sokf A, or S-O, 
C F K dash A. Nah, I hate that name. But <clears throat> Emerson uses a variation on the classic, um, on the classic serration pattern. And what is that? This classic serration pattern is a large scoop, which we can see right there in the center, and then uh, flanked on either side by three peaks. And those three peaks are little blades and they're, and they're chisel ground. So you have basically a hawk bill blade in the, in the big scoop sitting next to three outward pointing daggers. In Emerson's case, the center of those three outward pointing daggers is recessed. So they are not all on the same level. So you have three levels of cutting. You have the very highest, the peak of the dagger, if you will. You have the center dagger, which is a little bit lower. And then you have the hawk bill, which comes in the middle. So really, really accelerating your cutting. A lot of people, you know, serrations fell out of favor pretty quickly uh, due to the sharpening, I think. And also just due to the fact that it it's it, it's disruptive to the design. If if you're getting a knife and, and some of it has to do with how it looks, um, it's disrupting the design. So that's from my perspective. But from a real hardcore user's perspective, especially someone who's outdoors, who's doing a lot of carving, who's doing uh, stuff with wood, you don't, you don't want serrations there. Those serrations are there, um, in this case, in a 50-50 serration case or a partially serrated blade case, they are there uh, to extend the life of the blade in the field uh, because it takes a lot longer to dull serrations, a lot more surface area, a lot more sharp surface area there. And then just the contouring with the teeth uh, we'll keep this thing cutting longer than that edge will. So they are kind of a last ditch. They're like a Hail Mary there on your on your blade uh, for cutting when everything else is dulled out. But also it's there to help accelerate that cut, to start that cut. Something fibrous like jute or, or some sort of rope. You could have a very, very sharp edge slipping off of that. Imagine a highly polished V-ground edge uh, going up against jute jute rope it's it without uh without a bit of bite to it it's not going to sink in it's going to skate across that surface so serrations are there to start cuts um and uh and then also to get you through certain like i said fibrous materials but also this is kind of a tactical blade we're looking at emerson's here uh what might the serrations be for on a tactical blade uh, well, besides the rope and and the and the uh, webbing and all the other stuff you might have to cut, you also might have to cut through uh, leather, like a leather jacket or nylon, uh, like a heavy nylon uh, jacket in the winter or something like that. And those serrations, again, will start that cut. And if you notice on your serrated blades, they are always chisel ground, um, because you're coming at it from a from an uh, uh, a less of an angle, if you had that uh, V ground, they would be you know they they would not be very substantial, and would probably give way. So when you look at uh, serrations, they're always going to be chisel ground. And the cool thing is, is on Emerson's, the whole blade is always chisel ground. Uh, the edge that is sometimes the blade. Uh, most of my uh, Emerson's are V ground and then chisel ground on the edge. So uh, a natural setup here for serrations. By the way, this knife here is so cool. This sock dash A uh, really is so ergonomic. It's a little bit smaller than than most of the full size Emersons, and uh, doesn't get much uh, talk. Uh, I don't think they're currently making them, so maybe that's why. And then, of course, the CQC thirteen. This is a classic. My favorite uh, folding Bowie out there. And uh, this is wearing Tom Engelson's uh, Vantage Blade, uh, Vantage Edge Point, Vantage Blade Works uh, scales. He does awesome work. Check him out on Instagram, uh, specializing in Emerson's, but does other great stuff too. So serrations on these two. Again, the Emerson, the big scoop, which is like a hawkbill blade, and then the three points, which are like downward facing daggers. In Emerson's case, the center dagger is recessed, so you get three different levels of cutting okay now next up we're going to go to sort of the classic these all of these next blades 
have the sort of classic uh, serrations, and that is the scoop, the three peaks, and those three peaks are all on the same level. Let's start with the SOG uh, mini seal, uh, the SOG seal pup. This is a great fixed blade knife. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure they're making this anymore. Um, and, and if they aren't, it's only recently that they stopped. This was a big, big box store purchase. Um, and uh, I got the, the uh, sheath on the, uh, I bought the sheath afterward. But this, this knife is awesome. This thing rides in my backpack. This is my uh, carry fixed blade knife. Always, it's always in my backpack. So let's take a look at these serrations. Again, these are serrations uh, partially uh, on a partially serrated blade. These will start the cut. Again, if this is for a seal uh, or some sort of uh, military person, they're probably cutting rope, cutting webbing, cut cutting all sorts of uh, paracord and stuff. And say your OS 8 blade is getting dull out there in the field, you will always have these to, to fall back to. And they will usually work. I mean, it takes a long time to dull serrations. Again, here you'll you'll see that they are that those serrations are chisel ground. Here, let's see. And then as you turn it, you can see that uh, Sog has taken just this area to chisel grind, and then it's gone to a traditional V edge on the rest of the blade. So you have those th uh, three peaks between the scoops and they are at the same height. And so in between them, you have two scoops. <laughs> it's those curved scoops in the peaks that are what make these things um, so nasty and effective. Uh, scoops and peaks, baby, scoops and peaks. All right, that's the SOG Seal Pup. This one I have set up for um, lanyard carry just in case, since this is a, uh, uh, likely to be on me if I'm ever uh, stuck in the car and have to get home. I do have a get home bag in the car. But uh, so this I have that lanyard on just for, I don't know, safety purposes. Uh, keep it in my hand. If it's my one fixed blade, I definitely don't want to lose it. And I think it's always good just to have that option. Of course, I have it set up so you can take it off and and you don't need it. But uh, yep, I have it set up for in the waistband carry. Now this sheath from SOG has this goofy little slot here so you can feed in paracord theoretically and cut it without pulling this out. But in my experience, I don't know. I, I keep this knife pretty sharp, but I think it would have to be a lot sharper to make that little slot thing work. But a great knife and um, proof that SOG... SOG's got it. SOG's got it. They just have to keep accessing it. And I know they've done some pretty cool stuff with their fixed blades recently. Um, hiring someone uh, uh, a, a, someone great to to boost up their their uh, their fixed blades over there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I can talk about it. I'm not sure if I can talk about it. Uh, anyway, all right. Big deal. Amtac right here. Amtac Northman. A amazing knife. This thing is so cool. It comes in, in this size. This is the original size. And then an XL. And chances are you'll need the XL or the large. I'm not sure what, if it's an XL or a large. Uh, but uh, this barely fits in my medium-sized hands. Uh, but this is intended to be. This is designed by a, uh, a former SEAL, Navy SEAL. And uh, Bill Rapier is his name, which is just a great name for a an, a, an elite soldier and be someone who designs knives, Bill Rapier. A little on the nose, but I love it. Uh, so this is a intended to be a pocket fixed blade, and it is set up to be such. I have tried it in the waistband, uh, but with the length of this discrete carry clip coming above the sheath, uh, and my pants would be right about here, you're most likely cutting into the waistband as you, as you draw this out. So I don't mess with that. I do carry this in the front pocket, and it, it carries perfectly there. Uh, this sheath is really unique. You can see the uh, you can see the discrete carry clip here that's mounted on there. It's not moving. And then here you have a ferro rod built in. So this guy's a seal. He's not just thinking about uh, you know this as a weapon. He's thinking about this as a pocket knife that you have on you all the time. And then heaven forbid you're in a situation you need to strike flint and make fire because you're in a survival situation. Well, you have a pocket knife. That can handle it. On the back side, you have this Velcro pouch where you can keep, uh, 
you know, like a hundred dollar bill or as suggested a, 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 uh, a handcuff key, <laughs> which is kind of funny. I don't carry a handcuff key. Uh, thank God I don't find myself in handcuffs. Um, but who knows, knock on wood. But if I were to find myself in handcuffs and needed a key, how the hell are you going to fish this thing out of your pocket and get the key out of there? But I, I don't know. Maybe that's something other guys know how to do. Uh, this is a really nice G10 handle here. I'm going to extract the blade now and show these serrations. Uh, but this handle is really nice G10 with that milling coming in from either side. Uh, M390 blade steel. With, this has serial numbered 1169, baby. 1169. Uh, nice uh, distal tapered blade. And it reminds me of a ski and do, uh, the knife that the uh, Scotsmen wear in their socks. Uh, again, we have the triple peak with the large scoop in the middle. That's three daggers and one hawk bill. So, we, okay, so here it's six daggers and three hawk bills, making up that run of, of uh, serrations on the Northman. Um, so let me show you the size of this. Here it is in my hand in a, in a hammer fist. I'll use my left hand here. Here it is in a hammer fist and uh, or I should just, yeah, hammer grip here. And you can see my finger is just barely not coming up onto the blade. Now, this is not my preferred grip for this anyway, but I feel like with that stout and incredibly acute point, like it's, it's coming to a pyramid there, basically, that really stout and acute point, very, very, very sharp. I have no doubt that I could uh, thrust this and uh, not, you know, depending on what I hit I, in any case, I think it would be very hard for me to run up onto that, uh, with those ergonomics, but I know in this grip, in the reverse grip with that awesome, uh, uh, bird's beak there and that thumb plate that you just put your thumb on. This is an awesome downward thrusting, uh, you know, defensive style, uh, blade here. Uh, so those serrations, when my father bought this for me, this is an expensive knife. And my dad bought it for me. Thank you, dad. He's a very generous guy. And he is also an impressionable guy. Dad, if you're listening, uh, just listen up. I, all I mean by that is he loves gear. He's always loved things. Growing up, he'd get into little things and he'd collect them for a little while and then move on. But but never like knives with me or things that my brother collects. Um, He's getting into it, though, and he's been reading the Jack Carr books. And uh, Jack Carr and uh, James Reese likes to likes to list out the gear in great detail. And he loved the description of this knife. So he decided to buy uh, me and my brother one, which is so cool. And uh, and they come with a trainer and another sheath. And um, he asked, do you want serrations? I remember I was out with my family. He's like, do you want serrations or not? And I was like, <gasps> going back and forth. And then finally, I was like, it's a small blade. Uh, it should have as much cutting capability as possible. Uh, so I went I went with the serrations, and I'm happy I did. It looks cool and very clean without the serrations, this design. Uh, but with the serrations, it just adds uh, confidence into this recipe. I think I'm going to do a wardrobe change after this show, and I think I'm going to carry the Northman on me today. I love this knife. All right, putting it down aside now, let's talk about the most famous, and those are uh, the Spidey Edge here. Now, I think they may have started it all with this, with this, with their Spidey Edge pattern here. So there you see the classic three peak with the large sharpened scoop in the center or three daggers and a hawk bill. Three daggers and a hawk bill walk into a bar. You know, you know how that one ends. It ends with this awesome Spyderco Delica Warncliffe, a gift. Let me wipe that off there. Sorry about that, hang on. Sorry, it is a bit of a fingerprint magnet because it's that uh, it's that nice Spyderco satin. Uh, this is the perfect shape and size for a small defensive uh, EDC knife. Uh, you've got that wonderful straight edge worn cliff, and then you're adding that you're just accelerating that straight edge uh, cutting power with those serrations. It's just uh, just a, a really effective combination. And then and then something that I really like about this knife in particular, but you add those serrations. If you needed to use this this innocent 
little tool. It's a Delica, right? If you need, and and then this has the uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works titanium scales and a uh, MXG gear clip, uh, aftermarket clip. Uh, but this is just a sort of an innocent little tool. But if you needed to use it in a fight, it fits perfectly in the hand as a serrated Pakal style knife. Um, and those serrations would be very, very, uh, you know, effective in, in your cause of liberating yourself from the scumbaggery that is attacking you, no doubt. But most of the time, like all of the time, you're just going to be using this to open up boxes. You're going to be using this for school projects. You're going to be using this for cutting rope and twine at work or whatever it is you cut at work. What? It, I don't really cut much at work uh, except for cardboard sometimes. Uh, but when I'm out on a video shoot with my guys and if they don't have the knife that I gave them, um, yeah, they'll, they'll cut, uh, they'll cut you know, mostly sash rope, I guess, if they're rigging something, something, but this, uh, chews right through it. No doubt. A great back pocket knife is the Delica. And with these serrations, totally awesome. Totally awesome, dude. All right. Next up my Microtex. I have two serrated Microtex and uh, Microtech does not shy away from serrations. They have some fully serrated knives, and I love that uh, because it 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 reeks of tactical. Uh, you know, Micro Microtech reeks of tactical, like this one here. This is the Ultra Tech. That's a four, nearly four and a half inch. So it's a four point. I'm sorry, three point four eight inch um, uh, M390 dagger ground blade with the top serrated. I just love that combination. You got one edge unserrated, one edge that's serrated. If you're looking at this like a work knife, uh, for some reason, you have double the life right up here. You have, you're doing all your, all your regular cutting chores here, uh, opening your boxes and doing whatever with the, with the regular edge. And then, uh, oh, uh, I got to cut some straps, those uh, packing straps and some rope and some twine. Well, you just use it backwards towards you using those serrations. Uh, a really great combination if you are using this as a work knife, which is, you know, I, to me, it's a total weapon, right? This is designed as a weapony type knife, but it doesn't have to be really. Actually, now that I'm talking about it, this, if it weren't illegal in your, in your location, this would be an awesome, like work knife, warehouse knife, because we all have seen the videos where people take these things and abuse the crap out of them. I mean, you can really, these are not just toys and <laughs> these are not just toys. They can take a hell of a lot of abuse, these Microtech autos. Um, there was a guy, and now I can't remember what his name is, but a charming gentleman who would take Microtech knives and just beat the hell out of them, and they keep coming back. So these uh, Ultratechs are, are no uh, exception in, in that case. And then you add the serrated, a whole other run of serrations and, uh, and edge. You get what I'm getting at. This is not just a weapon anymore even though it looks terribly weapony this is the troodon also that same setup uh and if you look closely here it might be better with the black blade here they do something a little different here so the those uh, little center scoops it's kind of the same you but if you can there let's see here yeah you can see that that they are working on different levels too so you got the large peak and then the small peak in the middle. So these are a little bit more like the Emerson serrations than they are like the Spyderco serrations. So, yeah, like the one in the center is a little bit smaller. So you're working on some different levels. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, these are the Microtex. Uh, one last thing before we get to Cold Steel. Uh, this is a cool one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I forgot another one here. I'm going to do this one first. This is the CRKT. I don't even remember what this model is called, frankly, but I'm calling it the Polkowski Casper fighter. I think it was called something like that. Al Polkowski, uh, one of my favorite uh, tactical fixed blade knife designers and makers from the nineties and Casper. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember his first name now. Sorry, uh, using that same pattern there that we saw on Spyderco. That was probably their cue at this time. Spyderco CRKT was doing a lot of serrations at the time too. This would make a great double-edged fighter here. I love this thing. But again, we see, we're seeing that chisel edge 
which also makes the regular plain edge wickedly sharp on this thing because we know that chisel ground edges are just extreme in their sharpness so this thing is uh i've always loved this knife this one sits uh at my wife's desk this is her her desk knife all right and then i wanted to show you this this blows all of the uh others not away but uh th th this one fits in no category at all this is the off-grid knives rapid fire rescue look at these serrations they look like vampire teeth and there is a let's see there is a pattern big four peaks big four peaks big four peaks big not being as the big scoop is not so much larger than the others that it's that noticeable but you can see there are four daggers between the large scoops on this one four daggers on the large scoop heading up towards cold steel uh, is this off-grid knives Warncliffe rapid fire you can get this Warncliffe rapid fire in um, a non-serrated black version but I keep this uh, orange rescue one in the car door this is right there next to me and hopefully uh, if I ever need it it hasn't rattled around and been ejected out the window or what have you but this is this is here for that uh, those serrations are just wicked, 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 wicked. I have a feeling that they would come off with heavy use, but you kind of only need them that one time, right, to, to really get you out of that pinch. Uh, but also, being so large and, and dulling down, you will get extended cutting life uh, in the saw fashion of it, you know. All right, putting this away, let's move to cold steel. I got a, I got a bunch of the cold steel... Um, serrated i'll show first the voyagers and using this one uh this is the the vaquero the shape that everyone loves so much especially lynn thompson uh but look at these serrations now five peaks between the scoops so it's like five little daggers one large hawk bill five little daggers one large hawk bill repeated over and over over this sinuous uh, S-shaped blade. So, in my opinion, these are the gnarliest of serrations. I think that these um, go, they last forever. By the way, I've had uh, I have my Vaquero Grande, which is the old version of this knife that I have used and used and used and not sharpened and then sharpened and used and used and used for so long, and those uh, serrations just keep on kicking. So they last a long time, and they're like chainsaws. Uh, I chose on on this uh, Voyager Tonto. I chose to got to got chose to get the serrations on this uh, for the same reason I have them on the um, on the Warncliffe here. Just adding that the serrations to that straight cutting edge uh, just makes it extra wicked. Plus, if this is super sharp and that edge is uh, on something fibrous it it really might skate because of the because of the lack of curve so just adding some of that bite with those five little daggers and the one hawk bill repeated down that edge seemed like the natural fit for the voyager all right next up i have the cold steel holdout this is a knife uh that uh, this is an aus 8 this is a knife that i figured really really wanted serrations uh, because it doesn't have a guard, and for some reason to me that meant uh, I wanted the the edge to be as just horrifyingly effective as possible, uh, so that um, on a slash, using this relatively um, uh, spear point style edge, I, I would get as much zing out of it as I could. Zing? As much zest out of it as I could. So that is the holdout. And plus, it is a six-inch blade. I, it just seemed like I should go as gnarly as I possibly could. All right, second to last here is the Talwar. I, I talked about this. Look at those serrations. Oh, this one needs it. I feel like anything that doesn't have the recurve and is glancing away should have it. Uh, should have those. All right, and last up, the granddaddy of them all. Uh, this is the I shouldn't say the granddaddy. I should say the, the nastiest of them all. This is the Black Talon II. Uh, those serrations on this blade just make it ridiculous. They say from the ridiculous to the sublime. Well, I guess this is sublime. Uh, you take a, 
uh, a geometry, a cutting edge, a profile that is just so um, gr like grimly effective. I don't know what the right word is. So incredibly effective at um, cutting soft tissue and such. And then you add those serrations. It's laughable um, how how effective and nasty that is. So uh, there it is, ladies and gentlemen, my, my serrated blade collection. Uh, I have, I had moved away from them for a while uh, thinking, Oh, you know, they're unnecessary and they don't cut right. And uh, I don't like the way they look. And I've come, come back around to really liking them and appreciating them, especially on tactical knives or knives where you think, you might be out there and and needing extra cutting after a long period of time. That's why I have, for instance, the SOG, which has relatively soft OS 8, but is a knife that I wouldn't cry too much over losing uh, in, in my get home bag uh, because it has those serrations. If that OS 8 dulls, I can always come back to those serrations. So uh, I know we've veered away from them in, in our uh, modern you know knife collecting, but consider serrations maybe on a couple of knives. Just like if you're a folder guy, you should consider getting a fixie and vice versa. You should consider getting serrations even if you're not a serration guy. All right. Like we do in the DeMarco household, I have beaten the dead horse with that. All right. Uh, join us on Sunday for Keith Beam. He's stick man from Cold Steel uh, and GSM Outdoors. We have a great conversation. Very interesting guy coming from the archery world. Self-made man came, came up with uh, some revolutionary deer blinds, sold them, and uh, became a player. So uh, definitely check out uh, Sunday's interview. It's great fun. Uh, we had a lot of cold steel here, so you're in the mood. Also, be sure to download the show to your favorite podcast app and listen whilst on the go. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.